Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Jihad Touma. I'm the director of the Center for Advanced Mathematical Sciences at the UB. Uh, very happy to have you with us. Uh, it's now 6 uh, p.m. in Beirut on a hot, uh, uh, politically and security speaking day. So I'm delighted to see so many of you with us joining us for uh, a talk uh, which is the first in a series of public lectures uh, on number theory uh, featuring uh, distinguished lecturers who will be bringing to life uh, 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 fundamental uh, problems in number theory, many of which have generated a lot of beautiful mathematics over uh, hundreds of years, some of them are more like a century for others. So this is an exciting initiative for us, and it is an initiative which came together with the coming together of uh, the number theory uh, research unit uh, at the Center for Advanced Mathematical Sciences at AUB. And that unit brings together two of our very active uh, mathematicians, uh, Professor Kamal Khouri Maktisi and Professor Wissam Raji, who are uh, joining us uh, for uh, this event, uh, together with their students and their collaborators, basically to celebrate number theory uh, at AUB, Lebanon and the region, uh, a field to which they have contributed now together for a couple of decades, uh, whether in terms of teaching very high level courses in the field or carrying out uh, international uh, level research in, in the field with some of the contributors being here uh, with us today. So this is a very exciting uh, time for us. The unit hopes to organize a number of activities, uh, structure mini courses dedicated to the subject. It has a number of international associates uh, who came together to provide support, advice and help sustain interest in the field uh, through our uh, unit and, uh, uh, and our center uh, along with it. Uh, for now, we have a series of lectures uh, 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 structured starting today with uh, what, what promises to be a quite an exciting talk by Professor Ken Ono on the Riemann hypothesis. It will be followed by another on Fermat's theorem uh, by uh, Professor Ribbit coming up in November. I invite you to visit uh, the website associated with the unit and to check regularly on its activities and some of the publications, which we hope will be open to a wide public that will, will start appearing very soon. So I'm very happy to have you all with us. Ken, thank you very much for agreeing to give uh, this talk uh, to uh, launch the series for us. Uh, Wissam, I leave the floor to you to introduce our speaker and his talk. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Jihad. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Ken Ono as the first speaker in our series of public talks at CAMPS. Uh, Professor Ono is the Thomas Jefferson Professor of Mathematics and the Chair of the Department of Mathematics at the University of Virginia. And he is also the Vice President of the American Mathematical Society. Professor Ono is one of the leading experts on this theory of modular forms. He has more than 180 publication and is known for his expertise in integer partitions. Ken is named among the most influential mathematicians by the academic influence. And he has solved the umbral moonshine conjecture and has found a framework that solved the question arising from Roger Ramanujan identities. He is one of the experts on Ramanujan and was the associate producer and the math consultant on the movie called The Man Who Knew Infinity. We have actually arranged a, a showing of this movie when it came out here in Beirut. Uh, so I would like now to welcome Professor Ono and I leave the floor for him to talk about the Riemann hypothesis and why it matters. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Wissam and Hiba and, and, and others. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's always a pleasure to talk about mathematics. And uh, uh, I woke up this morning to some of the very some troubling news that um, that you you have some difficulties in, in in Lebanon and Beirut today. So our thoughts and prayers are uh, uh, are for you today. And so um, I hope for 
in the future, a return to peace, a return to um, uh, human flourishing and all of that, uh, hopefully an end to the pandemic. And uh, let's let this next 50 minutes or so uh, be an escape so we can just talk about some beautiful ideas in terms of mathematics and some difficult problems. So this is a, a fun talk that I like to give. I first gave it uh, in New York City at the Simons Foundation uh, when they celebrated Pi Day in 2017. The Riemann hypothesis, why does it matter? So uh, there's a fun way for me to start because certainly at least in the United States, it's quite trendy to now give out $1 million prizes for various things, uh, often in uh, television reality programs. If you uh, make a fool of yourself, maybe you can win a million dollars or maybe you can survive incredible hardships on some deserted island and win a million dollars. And quite famously, there's a television show called Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? where if you answer enough consecutive questions, you can win a million dollars. But all of these things are quite difficult. And so here's a picture from that felt famous show uh, where the contestant is asked, which of the following is the largest? A peanut, an elephant, a kettle, or the moon? And well, as you can see, this contestant struggled, didn't win the million dollars because she unfortunately thought an elephant uh, is larger than the moon. I would like to see that elephant. But this is a fun way to start because I like the idea where people recognize the value in answering questions. Maybe there isn't very much value in answering the question as to what, what's larger, the elephant or the moon, but certainly uh, there are mathematical problems which have value, and I don't mean $1 million in value, but have value if they are solved. And it just turns out that the Clay Math Institute uh, at the turn of the century, 20th to 21st, identified a list of problems that they considered to be very important after consulting with experts. And the Riemann hypothesis is square in the middle of this list. Actually, I think the Riemann hypothesis should appear at the top of the list. Uh, it's probably clearly the oldest of the problems on this list. And uh, the point of this lecture is to explain why it matters. So if you solve the Riemann hypothesis or any of its other six companion claim math problems, uh, you will have done something important. And maybe winning a million dollars is not so important, uh, but that would be uh, your bounty, your prize. So there's a lot to say, but I think there's no better way to start this talk than to tell a few stories about the Riemann hypothesis before we delve into some mathematics. So here's a photograph of G.H. Hardy. He was a distinguished analytic number theorist. He's quite well known for having discovered Ramanujan or at least serving as Ramanujan's main mentor. He was a professor at Cambridge and in addition to his relationship to Ramanujan, he is well known for, uh, for the book, A Mathematician's Apology. He was the author of it. And if you have read the book, A Mathematician's Apology, you certainly will come away with the, the view that Hardy was a very unique individual. In the United States, we would call him a curmudgeon. If you read it, you would probably get the sense that this man was very arrogant, very opinionated, uh, but also very firm in, in, in the beliefs that he held. And so one of the things that you would learn about Hardy is that he thought so highly of himself uh, that he even had a personal feud with God, even though as an atheist, he didn't believe in God. This was sort of the, the games that he played in his mind. And the story that I want to share with you about, about the Riemann hypothesis uh, uh, and, and Hardy is this. On a trip to Denmark, Hardy sent his friend Harold Bohr a postcard and the postcard had very few words on it. The words were just have proof of Riemann hypothesis, RH, postcard too short for proof. And so if you know the story of Hardy and if you know the story of Fermat's last theorem, then you understand what's amusing about this story. You see, what was Hardy thinking? Hardy was thinking that his nemesis, God, would not let the boat sink on the return 
and give Hardy the same fame that Fermat had achieved with his last theorem, right? Fermat claimed to have a most brilliant proof of his, his last theorem. We don't believe he ever had one, but the story goes that his copy of Diophantus, the margin was just not wide enough to include this brilliant proof. And so that is Hardy's story with the Riemann hypothesis. A very famous story, anecdote related to the Riemann hypothesis involves David Hilbert. Hilbert, at the turn of the last century, 19th to the 20th, uh, he himself formulated a, a list of very central problems, which were, are called Hilbert's problems. And that, li that list famously inspired quite a bit of work uh, in 20th century mathematics. And it was that, uh, that, that inspiration that the Clay Math Institute was trying to uh, 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 you know, inspire with their Millennium Prize problems. And so what's telling about this quote from Hilbert is the following. If I were to awaken after having slept for a thousand years, my first question would be, has the Riemann hypothesis been proven? And so Hilbert being famous for establishing a list of important problems, paramount among those problems was the Riemann hypothesis. We can still, of course, ask this today. If we were to awaken a thousand years, uh, would the first question we ask, has the Riemann hypothesis been proven? Honestly, probably not. Maybe my first question would be, are people still around? Uh, but shortly after that, hopefully we would discover that people still are around. And then maybe for me, the third or fourth question would be, has the Riemann hypothesis been proven? So this lecture is what is the Riemann hypothesis and why, why does it matter? And so, although this is a bit premature, let me tell you what the Riemann hypothesis says. This is a famous, one of the few photographs that I am aware of, of Bernard Riemann. He was a distinguished mathematician who lived in the 19th century. He wrote only one paper on number theory. And this, this paper, which is the, essentially the inspiration for this entire talk, postulates a conjecture, formulates the conjecture, which we call the Riemann hypothesis. Here you have it on the screen, and it's a statement that the non-trivial zeros of some function called zeta of s has real part equal to one half. All right, if that doesn't grab your attention, I don't blame you, but what I wanna make very clear is that that little statement, if true, would have tremendous implications for mathematics. So why does that matter? And before we get to why does it matter, what does that statement even mean? So it turns out to answer that question, uh, I have to recall, recall some prerequisites. We have to go back to the very basics. And by that, I mean, I just wanna talk about prime numbers. So as we all know from grade school, a prime number is a natural number larger than one that has no positive divisors other than one in itself. And the reason why we care about primes at the outset is that the famous fundamental theorem of arithmetic indicates that the primes are the basic building blocks of the integers. Now, when you begin to study other sets of numbers, the complex numbers, the real numbers, or in number theory, maybe you'll study other fields of numbers or other rings of numbers, uh, these ideas become quite sophisticated and in some cases even false. Uh, but when we talk about just the ordinary integers, the stuff that is involved with adding and counting and multiplication, uh, we have this famous fundamental theorem of arithmetic that says that every positive integer apart from one factors uniquely as a product of primes, where if we reorder the factors, we don't really consider that as a different factorization. And so at first glance, you could ask students to list the prime numbers. This is a good exercise once they've mastered the, the ordinary multiplication tables. So you can do this with very, very young children. And it's not difficult to come up with the first few primes listed in order, say two, three, five, seven, so on and so forth. And so 
given this elementary introduction, at first glance, it might come as a surprise that there are any difficult questions about primes at all, considering that we introduce, introduce them to grade school children. So it's at this point that I want to share with you one of the most uh, striking quotes I know about the prime numbers. And this is by my friend, Don Zagier. Don Zagier says, primes grow like weeds, seeming to obey no other law than that of chance. Nobody can predict where the next one will sprout. And he goes on to say, the primes are even more astounding for they exhibit stunning regularity. There are laws governing their behavior and they obey these laws with almost military precision. And if you stare at this quote, your first thought might be, this can't possibly be right. How can the two parts of this quote be about the same sequence of numbers? How can they be somewhat random growing like reeds, but at the same time be um, uh, governed by rules that, uh, uh, that are described in this way as requiring military precision? So the purpose of my talk is to explain quite vividly why Don's description is quite beautiful, A, B, accurate, and C, why the laws that govern their behavior underlie some of the deepest questions that we still struggle with today in pure mathematics. So we have to go far back in time, long before uh, before Riemann to get a sense of what the questions Riemann wants to answer are all about. So let me go back to Eratosthenes around 200 BC. And what Eratosthenes did was he devised a very simple and beautiful algorithm that allows you to list all the prime numbers up to any given bound. So this picture that you see here lists the numbers up to 50, quite nicely laid out in a grid, five by 10 grid. And let me just describe to you what, what this algorithm is. It's a step-by-step -step process, which at the end lists all the prime numbers up to, in this case, 50. So we strike out the number one because it's not prime. And then the very next number must be prime because by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, every number is a product of primes. And we've struck out one, meaning that two, the next number must be prime. After we locate two as prime, we strike out all of the even numbers after two, namely four, six, eight, 10, so on and so forth. We strike out half of the numbers up to 50, culminating with 50, leaving 25 numbers. The very next number after two, which has not been removed, namely three, therefore must be prime. Once we've located three, we strike out all the multiples of three starting at six. So we strike out six, nine, so on and so forth. Ultimately, we strike out a 48. And then we've now st strike, now at over half of the numbers up to 50, we know, no, cannot be prime. That then leaves us that the next number after three, which has not been removed, namely five must be prime. You repeat this process. And by the time you'd locate seven and then remove all of its multiples, namely remove 14, remove 21, so on and so forth, you'll discover the primes up to 50. And so this beautiful procedure, after you've culminated with striking out the multiples of seven, a moment's thought reveals that all the numbers that must be left that have not been removed, these are the numbers that, ha that have boxes around them, must be prime. So we've discovered the primes two, three, five, seven, up to 47. All of the numbers that are left are prime. Indeed, because any number up to 50, which is not prime, has to be divisible by a number which is not larger than its square root. We multiply two numbers together to get it. One of those factors does not exceed the square root. And the square root of 50 is smaller than eight. And so the largest prime uh, that you have to sieve out by is seven. So it's easy to emulate this process. If you want to strike out all the prime numbers up to 100, you will discover that the process here, if I had replaced 50 by 100, 
would have also discovered all the primes up to 100, because after seven, the next prime you have to worry about is 11, but 11 is already larger than the square root of 100. And so all that extra work um, uh, would not have required an extra round of what I just described. So this is a very efficient procedure. Unfortunately, this procedure doesn't tell us a lot about the theory of the primes. All it does is give a recipe, a recipe for producing a list of primes in a finite set. If you wanna prove theorems about all of the primes, well, it actually turns out that when Aristosthenes was alive, we already had a theorem. There's a beautiful theorem by Euclid that says there are infinitely many primes. What I like about the theorem is that it's a theorem that's easy to state. It's a theory that is, it's a theorem that is easy to understand. And it is also given by a proof that is easy to criticize. When we criticize a proof, we're not actually saying that proof is bad. When you criticize a proof, you're recognizing through humility that unless your theorem is the definitive theorem in the subject, you're recognizing that the problem that you really want to answer is deeper than what you've been allowed to uncover from your proof. So when you teach courses and you prove a theorem, in many cases, it's a good idea to try to criticize the proof to identify the next questions that we should be asking as scientists. So Euclid's theorem is a wonderful example of that. There are infinitely many primes, easy to state and definitely easy to prove. So here is the proof. Suppose that there are R primes listed in order, P1 equals two, P2 equals three, all the way up to an Rth prime. It turns out that given these R primes, whether you conclude there are, these are the only ones or not, Euclid's argument allows you to find a next prime. Almost never certainly the very next prime. You can prove that only happens finitely often. Uh, uh, and, and how does this work? You multiply these R primes together, P1 through PR, you get a large number, add one to it to get a number called capital P. And then you divide this capital P using the fundamental theorem of arithmetic into a product of primes. And what you discovered is its prime factors cannot be among the R primes you started with because by construction, the R primes you started with all leave a remainder of one when you divide capital P by them. Therefore, there cannot only be finitely many primes because you could iterate this process to always find a next prime after any given set of R plus one primes. All right, so let's analyze this proof in, over the course of the next few slides and we'll discover that this proof isn't very good. There are many kinds of infinite sets. And so if I were to give you a number like 1 million, and use Euclid's proof to try to estimate how many prime numbers you would encounter by counting up to 1 million, you'll quickly be frustrated in that Euclid's proof is purely existential. It's not really a process that is synchronized with the popping up of primes as weeds, just like Don described them. It's not synchronized for that task. If you wanna find a proof that is synchronized with that task, it turns out that you have to wait a very long time. You have to wait until the work of Euler before we get a sense of how one could do this in a better way. So what I like about Euler is that Euler got a lot of mileage out of just the geometric series in the sense of calculus, but also in the sense of formal power series. And both are useful uh, in, in their own right. For us today, I want to use the geometric series in the sense of calculus. So if R is a real number with absolute value less than one, you could write down the geometric series in R and recognize that as a simpler rational function, one divided by one minus R. And just by using the geometric series, we can record and begin to assemble lists of very, very strange infinite series expansions. So here are the first ones that I want to describe because they lead into what Riemann had in mind when he formulated his Riemann hypothesis. So if my cursor appears here, I hope it does, 
it's, it's circling around immediately to the right of this first row. If R is one half, the geometric series in a half can be rewritten in the right-hand side as a sum of the reciprocals of the powers of two, right? That's what a geometric series is. One plus a half plus one fourth plus the reciprocals of all the higher powers of two. In terms of, in terms of, um, in terms of the rational number, it's one divided by one minus a half. That just happens to be the number two. What if we wanted to multiply geometric series together that correspond to an increasing sequence of the first few primes? Well, what you would do next is illustrated by the second row. I know two is prime. I know three is prime. So let's multiply together the geometric series for their reciprocals. If you multiply that out, what you're doing is you're summing up the reciprocals of integers that are not divisible by any prime greater than three. And if you add that up after having, or if you, if you multiply out these two expressions, that's also more simply called the number three. If you now multiply together the geometric series for the reciprocals of the first three primes, one half, one third, and one fifth, of course, multiply that out. You're summing up the reciprocals of the positive integers that are not divisible by seven or any larger prime. And that simplifies to being simply 15 fourths. And if you repeat this again for the first four primes, the sum of the reciprocals of the positive integers that are not divisible by 11 or any larger prime simplifies to be the sequence, the rational number 35 eighths. So in this way, you have a sequence of rational numbers, two, going to three, growing to 15 fourths, growing to 35 eighths, which are exactly synchronized with the popping up, as in the popping up of weeds of the next prime. And so what, what Euler had in mind, which you, Riemann beautifully implemented, was trying to get a sense of the rate of increase of this sequence of rational numbers because they are perfectly synchronized with the addition of a new prime in order. So formally, we can use the fundamental theorem of arithmetic together with, idea, with, with this idea to compartmentalize this in the, in, in the form of a single series. Using the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, if you take the product over all the primes P, the formal series one divided by one over P to the S, that compiles as an algebraic gadget to be the summation one over N to the S. It is an algebraic gadget because the S here is a formal parameter, which I haven't yet said anything about. However, if I wanna use the methods of calculus and later complex analysis to make sense out of this expression, I'm going to be tempted to substitute in values for S and try to get numbers out of it. Euler himself famously did this. So if you were to let S be two, the left-hand side is just summing up the reciprocals of the perfect squares. And he was able to show that compiles nicely to be the number pi squared over six. And quite famously, for every even integer S, there's a formula like this. So if you sum up the reciprocals of the fourth powers, or if you sum up the reciprocals of the six powers, there's a very simple closed formula for these expressions. So we haven't come a long way, but let me show as a, in, in the spirit of critiquing the beautiful proof by Euclid, let's see if we can do a little bit better than what Euclid did, but by somehow still keeping some of his intrinsic ideas. So we will do that just by using elementary calculus. So let's let pi of n denote the number of primes less than n. So for example, if n is 10, if you were to count up to 10, the primes that you would encounter would be two, three, five, and seven. So there are four primes up to 10. So pi of 10 is four. And let's just use very easy calculus to show that pi of n grows at least as quickly as the natural log function. So pi of n is at least the natural log minus one. So I'm not going to try very hard. So don't judge me for not trying. 
This is actually the point. Sometimes by just introducing a little idea, even without trying, that little idea gives you more. Right, Euclid proved there's infinitely many primes, but that proof doesn't give us an indication of how quickly the primes must sprout up. This proof does it. So let's let the primes again be in order, P1, P2, P3, so on and so forth. And I just want to make the observation that the first prime is at least as large as two. The second, second prime is at least as large as three. And those are just taking advantage of the fact that the number one, the first number you ever count by, you have to skip when counting primes because it is not prime. And so the jth prime is at least as large as j plus one. I'm not trying. All I'm saying is that when we count, the jth prime has to be at least as large as j plus one because we skip one. Now calculus tells us that the natural log of n is the definite integral from one to n of one over x dx. And in your calculus class, you might estimate this natural log, this integral when n is some positive integer. And one way for doing that is by introducing the Riemann sum. And here, let me introduce the Riemann sums that correspond to width one. So it would break the interval from one up to n if n is a positive integer with intervals of width one. You can estimate, of course, from above the definite integral by adding up the areas of each of these integrals, each of these rectangles, which is definitely above the area that you're trying to estimate. And so from this picture, you see that the natural log of n is certainly less than the nth harmonic number. The picture is the proof. Now, what I want to access is pi of n. So let's just simply declare pi of n to be the symbol called k. And what I want to do is devise a method for accessing k from my formula for the logarithm. So when we say that pi of n is equal to k, this is also saying that every positive integer up to n doesn't require the knowledge of anything beyond the kth prime to factor it, right? The last prime you encounter up to n is the kth prime. So we know how to factor all the numbers up to n with the knowledge of only the first k primes. Well, I can then reinterpret the nth harmonic series as being bounded above by the product of the geometric series, one for each of those k primes, just like we did a moment ago, except instead of trying to write down those sequence of rational numbers that increase, I'm going to replace that by a smaller number, the natural log, because I'm allowed to do that. Now, it might look like that I need to know where the primes are to get information about the natural log, uh, but that's not true. If I know that the jth prime is at least j plus one, I can actually get an, another upper bound for the natural log function by using this very weak proxy for the location of the primes. So if you clear denominators and use the fact that the jth prime is at least as large as j plus one, I get this very weak but true statement that the natural log of n does not exceed the product one plus one over j as j walks through one from k. I'm replacing one over one plus j by a very weak proxy for the jth prime. But of course, one plus one over j is the same as j plus one over j. And so if you multiply that all out, I find that the natural log is less than this telescoping product where each numerator cancels with the following denominator with the exception of the last numerator, which is k plus one. k was my symbol for the number of primes up to n that I declared, so I can replace that by pi of n. And of course, what we now have is that pi of n grows at least as quickly as natural log minus one. And that's better than Euclid's proof. Well, that now gives us insight into what Gauss was doing when he, as a child, calculated values of pi of x. He would have calculated a table very much like this. In fact, the paper in which he did these calculations still exists. And he compared pi of x with the values x over the natural log of x. And he conjectured, and in fact, he conjectured something a little bit more precise than this, 
Gauss conjecture that the number of primes up to x should be very much like this integral, the logarithmic integral, which is asymptotic to x over log x. And this conjecture uh, is the difficult problem that inspired Riemann. It's much better if, if this is definitely better than the sieve of Aristosthenes. And if you were to divide this right hand column into the middle column, you would see these ratios do tend rapidly to one. And this is where Riemann comes in. In his only paper written in number theory, on number theory, Riemann made use of this expression that I just played with using elementary calculus. He defined his Riemann zeta function. He defined many of its properties and he posed this famous Riemann hypothesis. And why did he do it? He did it because he wanted to present a strategy for proving Gauss's conjecture. What is brilliant about this strategy is that this strategy has been generalized all over number theory to a field called the entire theory of L functions. This is now part of what has blown up into what's called the Langlands program, where L functions and methods from harmonic analysis and analysis and Galois theory all come together for counting problems, which are vast generalizations of Gauss's conjecture. So if you're interested in the history of the development of mathematics, this is important for that reason. So in his paper, he defines the zeta function as I've described it, but only, valued, value, only valid for complex numbers with real part bigger than one. He then uses the methods from complex analysis to define the analytic continuation of this function. So if you're familiar with complex variables, you can often analytically continue, which means define your functions going beyond the naive domains of definition. Riemann did this by means of what's called the integral representation of the zeta function. So I'll spare you of that, but it's quite beautiful. And what is immediately apparent from this integral representation is that this function has a pole at s equals one, which you can recognize as the standard fact from calculus that says that the harmonic series diverges. This functional equation, there's a, there, there's a beautiful symmetry that the zeta function satisfies that arises from this integral. Integrals can, can be manipulated under changes of variable. And this particular integral includes a function which is highly symmetric. It's a special case of what is called a modular form. And the end result is that the zeta function when evaluated at S reflects its values at one minus S when you take into account some very strange factors that intervene. And it turns out that because of these strange factors, the zeta function has zeros at all the negative integers, which are important for other reasons, but not for today's talk. So let me indicate some magical things that arise from, these, from this theorem. So let's home in on this very third part. Zeta of S reflects its values at one minus S. So there's a very famous story about Ramanujan. He was an, uh, an amateur mathematician who, was, who thought his ideas came to him as visions from a goddess. Uh, I don't have time to go into his story, but he is insp an inspirational figure to all scientists and students throughout the world. He was discovered uh, or he made himself available to Hardy through a, a series of letters. And the famous mathematician Hardy that I described earlier uh, invited Ramanuj and study with him in the early 20th century. And in one of the letters that Ramanuj wrote to Hardy, he made this astonishing claim. Ramanujan writes, under my theory, the sum of the positive integers isn't infinity. It's not even positive. It's negative one twelfth. And if I were to tell this to you, at one, you will at once point me out to the uh, lunatic asylum. Hardy, as an analytic number theorist and being fully aware of Riemann's work, must have instantly recognized the genius in Ramanujan's observation. Certainly, given the fact that uh, the statement as written is false, but offers a glimpse of what Riemann himself discovered in his Riemann function. 
So as I mentioned very early in this talk, the sum of the reciprocals of the perfect squares adds up to pi squared over six. And in the last slide, I defined for you a functional equation for the zeta function that evaluates zeta at s related to its values at one minus s. Well, what if you don't use the Riemann continue Riemann's definition and just wanted to declare what zeta of minus one should be? Well, summation one over n to the minus one would just be a sum of the positive integers. So you could view zeta's extended function as being a glimpse, a glimpse of what the sum of the positive in integers might want to be. So that's, that's what I'm doing here. But at the same time, if you then use Riemann's functional equation that says its values at s reflect to one minus s, well, one minus negative one is two, zeta of two by Euler is known to be pi squared over six, and if you plug into these expressions, if you know what these terms are, it multiplies out magically to be the value that Ramanujan knew, which is negative 112. And this is one of the stories that struck Ramanujan as being quite remar remarkable, as being a glimpse of some real incredible power of creativity. Well, let me just fast forward. If you graph the values of the zeta function, one half plus i t, where i is the square root of minus one on a computer, you would get this beautiful curve. On this beautiful curve, when t is zero, you would find that the zeta function is around negative 1.46. And as t walks from zero to 50, you'll discover that this curve crosses the origin a number of times. These are the first few zeros that you would encounter. And Riemann's hypothesis is that the only zeros you would encounter apart from the negative evens must live on this mesmerizing curve. There should be no other zeros that this function encounters other, other than what you would get by extending that computer program to infinity. So as complex numbers, the imaginary parts of those first few zeros are indicated here. And so what Riemann wanted to know is, is it true that every place where the zeta function vanishes for complex numbers in this strip must live on this vertical line. And what Riemann said is, it would really be desirable to know that this is true. So why does that matter? Well, it matters because it helps us count primes. Here's a theorem that says that Gauss's conjecture, the so-called prime number theorem, is equivalent to showing that the limit as x goes to infinity of psi of x over x is simply the number one. What is the function psi of x? Psi of x is an indicator function. Imagine walking on the positive real axis and adding up log p every time you encountered a power of a prime. So what, what would psi of five be? If you count from zero to five, you encounter two, the prime two, you encounter the prime three, and you encounter four, which is two squared. So what is psi of five? It's log two plus log three plus again log two. So what you get is a non-differentiable staircase function that takes a step up every time you encounter a power of a prime. If you graph this on a computer, you get a graph that looks like this. And if you, and, and if you draw the line, the linear line, well, all lines are linear. If you draw the linear, best linear fit to this particular segment of this graph, you get this line, which looks like it has slope one. Well, then you would understand what the prime number theorem is really about. What Riemann understood, certainly in his mind, was this graph. And what he wanted to say is it, there should be a way of putting a boundary above the stair step function and a boundary below the stair step function, which was like a law, a law that said the stair step function would never be allowed to cross the boundary below it, never cross the boundary above it, therefore guaranteeing sort of a ping pong effect guaranteeing where prime powers must exist. But since the powers are so rare, this would be a device for locating the primes. 
So why do the zeros matter? Well, it turns out that von Mangold and Riemann certainly knew this. Von Mangold proved that this function psi of x, which is doing its very best to mirror the line y equals x, is really nothing but x plus some innocuous factors plus the generating function for the non-trivial zeros. So this lowercase x is really a capital X. If x goes to infinity, these two terms are in, inconsequential. And so the oscillation that, that dictates each of the steps in that discontinue in that non-differentiable function really is encoded by the location of the zeros. That's why the non-trivial zeros matter because it tells you when you compile them all, where all the steps are, meaning that all the zeros once studied properly actually know on the nose where all the primes and their prime powers are. So it turns out that using this idea, you could prove that the, a weak form of the prime number theorem is true. Gauss's conjecture in its weakest form was proven by Audemars and de Lavalle Poussin using this kind of idea. And in just one line, what they proved is that the real part of all of these zeros are, is strictly smaller than one. You have to do a little bit of work, but the main idea is if you could prove that these zeros uh, all have real part less than one, that's enough to prove a weak form of what Gauss really wanted. And that's what we call the prime number theorem. So you may say, why does the Riemann hypothesis matter if the weak form of Gauss's conjecture is known to be true? Well, it matters because its truth implies an incredible statement. Suppose you want to calculate the number of primes up to 10 million. Well, the truth of the prime number theorem, the truth of the Riemann hypothesis says that the difference between pi of x and that logarithmic integral, which you can calculate with a calculator, is bounded by an explicit error term. So if x is a million, the square root of a million is about a thousand, log of a million is really small, divide that by eight pi, you would have a very, very accurate accounting for how many primes there are up to x because the deviation from the first term estimate is strictly bounded by a law. One of those laws that Don was referring to that is militaristic. It turns out that the Riemann hypothesis used in this kind of way has many applications. Basically every deep problem about primes relies somehow on a phenomenon that would be better understood under RH. Almost any counting problem in arithmetic geometry is somehow would benefit from the truth of Riemann hypothesis. Things like elliptic curves and class groups. If you want to study integers represented by sums of squares, uh, you also need to know about the Riemann hypothesis, as, as, as I will explain in a minute. And even based on your first course in abstract algebra, where you learn about groups, the Riemann hypothesis uh, uh, plays an insidious role. Let me just describe the special case of the symmetric groups. If I wanted to put an upper bound on the size of the orders of elements in the permutation groups, how would you do it? Well, you know that permutations are given by a cycle structure. The order of those elements is the least common multiple of those cycles. And actually putting a bound on that least common multiple requires knowing the prime, factor, prime factorizations of these LCMs. But how can you really do that unless you know how they are synchronized with primes? So we're not even very good at proving effective bounds on orders of elements and permutation groups. And in, our, in terms of real world applications for the internet or cryptography or information security, running times of algorithms that, that these, these systems rely on are generally computed under the assumption that the Riemann hypothesis is true. The Riemann hypothesis is everywhere. And if you were to scan the, the mathematical literature, you'll discover that there are thousands of results that are proven assuming it's truth. Let me add a little fun story, which really indicates how insidious the Riemann hypothesis can be with regard to specific problems. So let me tell you about my favorite mathematician, Ramanujan again. 
One of Ramanujan's favorite quadratic forms is listed here, x squared plus y squared plus 10z squared. And in, in your graduate course on number theory, you could answer the question that pertains to the first part of this quote. The even numbers, which are not of the form x squared plus y squared plus 10z squared can be classified. So when you plug in integers for x, y, and z, what are the numbers you get? Well, in the even case, it's easy. You get them all apart from numbers that are of this shape. However, if you want to ask which odd numbers cannot be obtained by this, Ramanujan said, the odd numbers that are not of this form, namely that begin with this list, do not seem to obey any simple law. So it's easy to show that seven is not of the form x squared plus y squared plus 10z squared. If it were, z would have to be zero. So then seven would have to be a sum of two squares, which it is not. So given any odd integer, you could do a finite check to decide whether or not that odd number is missed. And what Ramanujan wants is a simple law that would in, which would save you from having to do that simple check. Well, one of my first theorems as a postdoc, I, uh, I, I wrote this paper with my friend Sandra Rajan. This was published in Invencionis. We proved that under the Riemann hypothesis, a slightly more general version than what Riemann had, under the Riemann hypothesis, the only positive odd numbers that are missed are given in this list, and that's the end of the list. So Ramanujan was able to go up to 391. Maybe he knew these other two. But the Riemann hypothesis says that there are only two other odd numbers that are missed. So if the Riemann hypothesis were true, then you would know that every larger number after this is the sum of squares as dictated with these coefficients. But it's better than that. A few years ago, I asked my PhD student, Robert Lemke Oliver, to try to prove a converse. Namely, if there is an odd integer n, larger than 2,719, what would the implications then be for the Riemann hypothesis? Robert proved that if n is an odd integer greater than something like 10 to the 15th, then he located a zero for a specific zeta function that defies the Riemann hypothesis. So what is my point? My point is the Riemann hypothesis for the L functions that are relevant here is equivalent to determining which integers are not represented. They are the same problem, right? If you know it's true, the only examples that are missed are here. If you find an odd number which is missed, we can find a zero off the zeta function. So the simple law that Ramanujan wanted, it's not so simple. It's called the generalized Riemann hypothesis for a very specific family of functions. It is that insidious. We do not have the right to answer Ramanujan's question literally without solving the Riemann hypothesis. That is what that says. So there's a lot of evidence for the Riemann hypothesis. My time is running short, so I don't want to talk about that. There are various attempts for attacking the Riemann hypothesis. Nobody is very close, so I don't really want to talk about that. Let me just take the last two minutes or so to tell you about some work that I did with Don Zaghi and my former students that um, uh, shed some light on this insidious problem. Going back to the 1970s, Freeman Dyson, Hugh Montgomery, and Andrew Olitzko studied the distributions of the zeros using a computer. And based on some heuristics coming from um, the distribution of uh, the nuclei of heavy atoms, Freeman Dyson conjectured together with Hugh Montgomery that the zeros of the zeta function should be distributed like eigenvalues of large her her random Hermitian matrices. And so let me ask, let me just naively say what you could do with that. Well, based on elementary calculus, you might try to approximate the zeta function through its Taylor series at s equals a half. That is an infinite power series, and you might want to study the zeros of its truncations. So if you took the degree 100 Taylor polynomial, it has 100 zeros. You could plot them on the complex plane, and you get a picture like this. 
What's unfortunate is that although some of the zeros do look like they're on the real part of S equals a half, a lot of them are off of it. Maybe 100 is just not large enough degree. Maybe if we took a degree 200 polynomial, we will do a better job of locating the zeros. Well, it is true that you find more zeros that very closely approximate the zeros of the zeta function, but you also get more zeros that are off the zeta function, making this outline of lips. And by the time you get to degree 400, you certainly also find some more zeros of the zeta function, but also many zeros off of it. These blue ones are very annoying. What Dyson, Montgomery, and others were asking about was the vertical distribution of the placement of these dots. If I want to study the vertical distribution of these dots, it's really annoying to know that most of the zeros of these Taylor polynomials have nothing to do with the zeta function. <clears throat> they have more to do with the mistake of truncating. So the takeaway from those examples is, well, maybe some of the roots can be approximated very well, but the others are annoying. And in the last minute, I'm sorry that I ran out of time. Let me just say that a distinguished analyst named Jensen and Polia discovered a procedure for avoiding the blue dots. They discovered what are called Jensen polynomials shown here for an arbitrary sequence A of N, which we will later replace with the Taylor coefficients of the zeta function. And they were able to show that the Riemann hypothesis is equivalent to the zero, understanding the zeros of this doubly infinite sequence of polynomials. For every degree D and every shift N, you could substitute in some Taylor coefficients and ask, are the zeros always real numbers? And when that happens, you say your polynomial is hyperbolic. This is their theorem. And their theorem is that the Riemann hypothesis is equivalent to the hyperbolicity of all of the polynomials in the sequence. There are no blue dots. There are no blue dots. If, if, if the Riemann hypothesis is true, this scaling moves those zeros to the real line. What was known? Very little was known. This was known for finitely many polynomials by CHAS, by a computer. It was known for all, all, all of these degrees only up to three through the works of um, people through the 80s. And nothing was known for degree larger than four, four or larger. What did we prove? Together with Don Zaghi and my two PhD students, Michael Griffin and Larry Rowland, we were able to reformulate their condition and prove that not only must these polynomials generally have all real roots, we could locate them in the sense of a limit. So if you fix a degree D and let the ends go to infinity, we were able to renormalize these polynomials so that they land on what are called the Hermit polynomials. The Hermit polynomials are the model for this random matrix model. We were able to then also show that for all degrees up to 10 to the 20th, for every N, all of these polynomials are hyperbolic. Before, nothing was known for degrees bigger than four, four or bigger. Now we've got them all up to 10 to the 20th. And so for all of them up to 10 to the 20th, the conclusion is true. And for every degree, for sufficiently large n, their condition is always true. And so that's a little progress that we have made showing that in almost every aspect, uh, the Riemann hypothesis expectation that we would hope to be true actually is true. We do not prove the Riemann hypothesis because there's nothing saying that if D is much larger than 10 to the 20th, what's preventing the first 50,000 of these ends from being a counterexample? We've only shown that from some point on, one will never find any further counterexamples. But anyway, that's what I want to say in this talk. And so the point is, I hope I've convinced you that the Riemann hypothesis has a very colored history. It really matters. And although none of us are very close to proving the Riemann hypothesis, we have recently shed some light on the polio Jensen idea. Uh, we will never prove the Riemann hypothesis this way, but in so doing, we recognize that in, in, in a funny way, the GUE random matrix model prediction of um, 
of Montgomery and Alitsko and Dyson uh, uh, in a funny way um, makes contact with something that you can actually prove. So with that, let me stop. Thank you for your time. Uh, and if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take a few for a few moments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken, for this talk. Uh, please, if anybody has any question, you can unmute and question. Uh, uh, I have a question. Yes. But... Uh, uh, I was wondering uh, what special properties of the sequence gamma of n uh, you've used in your proof of the theorem that you mentioned uh, at the end of yeah. the talk. I, we basically write down an exact formula now for 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 the, the Hehler coefficients. Before our work, uh, it was I think quite difficult to compute these accurately, which is what which is the main reason that people had difficulty proving um, more theorems about the hyperbolicity. Uh, it, it isn't actually very hard, but if you read our paper you'll see that we have a very precise description for these derivatives. Uh, may I ask another question? <clears throat> sure. So uh, I, I'm just interested in that property. So, so would you look at, for example, ratios of these coefficients or oh, yeah, 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 yeah. of ratios of these coefficients? I see your question. Yes. So when you write down an asymptotic for us, so let's not talk about gamma, let's just talk more generally. If I have a sequence A of N, and you study at the, their asymptotics, you're usually interested in A of N as N goes to infinity. But what are these polynomials really about? These polynomials are really about grouping together D consecutive coefficients, A of N, A of N plus one, A of N plus D, right? So our idea is to write down an asymptotic expression for A of N plus J divided by A of N. Yes. But you really have to know precisely the role of J versus the role of n and do yes. it in a very precise way to get these asymptotics. Okay. So what we show is how to write down the logarithm of the ratio a of n plus j divided by a of n as a power series in j whose coefficients are functions in n, but we can co control the error term. It's much, much, much stronger than asymptotic. It's like a micro local asymptotic. And that's the property that we determine. Good question. Other questions? Anybody has any any more questions for our speaker? But that was an excellent question. So if you have other sequences where this idea is important, our paper will explain uh, what needs to be done to prove similar theorems. Yes, okay. Um, I, I, I might make a, a small comment here. Sure, sure. Uh, this is reminiscent when, when uh, Heyman, uh, in, uh, uh, in reference to the Bibra conjecture, he showed that uh, the limit of the coefficient of a one-to-one -one function in the unit disk over n is strictly less than one, which didn't actually give the Bibra conjecture. And it took a whole construction by the branch to actually fin finally give the thing there. Right. Another comment is that there is this book by Saf Varga and Edre on uh, uh, zeros of sections of power series, where oh, okay. I there don't is know an that. idea that is reminiscent of looking at gamma of n plus j over gamma n and doing something about it. Ah, oh, okay. Just well, yeah, I'm not familiar with that. Um, I won't be surprised if these similar ideas are places. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the Taylor polynomials that you mentioned with those, you know, yeah. blue uh, groups. I was wondering where did these polynomials come from? Oh, just take a power series, expand as a Taylor series, and truncate after 100 terms. Uh, okay, that's all so that much. that is. That's all that that is, right? But I think the 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 examples show that you shouldn't do that. That's not a good problem. Great. So I apologize. Okay. I actually have a meeting I have to run to. I'm unfortunately chairman, and so uh uh. Um, <laughs> maybe one minute to take more questions, but other than that, I really do have to, to race off to some administration. Okay. I Any would rather more? be here. I would rather be here. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions?
Okay, okay, Ken, thank you very much for this talk. Okay, you're welcome. Yeah, okay. Right, have a good day, everyone, okay. and uh, uh, let's all wish for a better future. Yes, okay. thanks. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Have bye. a good day, bye.